there's a whole new generation of young people who are uh, discovering that psychedelic plants and vegetables can be used for trance experiences. It's called acid house music. Uh, the, the basic uh, strategy here is that you set up a hypnotic trance experience uh, with either LSD and uh, or XTC, and you just kind of dance for four hours. And then there are certain words, mantras that come in and out. And it's amazing how another generation intuitively, instinctively develop the group shamanic uh, uh, experience, and uh, uh, it's, it's becoming very, very popular in Europe and this country. Nowhere is the occult world more powerfully realized in contemporary music than in the confluence of DJs, hypnotic rhythms, strobing lights, covert all-night parties, drug usage, and new age ideologies that define much of the rave subculture. I mean, the hippies talked about it for ages. Dawning of the Age of Aquarius. It's here, it's coming to you now. It's here, you know? Listen and be reborn. What began as an underground phenomenon, often relegated to exotic locales in India and the Mediterranean, has become mainstream, with events drawing thousands of people in cities around the world. But as we've seen throughout this series, there's a lot more going on than just music and people having a good time. Both the musicians and the audience understand that there's a profound spiritual vibe going on as well. You should let go of all your inhibitions and dance your f***ing socks off, because um, that letting go process will open you up. You can't bottle the feeling of just total euphoria, like when a DJ just brings you like to this level where you're just like totally out of your head. Your consciousness is expanded because of this supernatural thing that happened to you. As close as you can get to God, this is the closest I've ever felt to being with God. Rave music and techno music and the new dance music is the flowering of new, new spirituality. This new spirituality is in fact quite old. The cultivation of altered states of consciousness through a variety of techniques and substances that have been used shamanistically for thousands of years. Let's go back to you know, indigenous cultures, to the ancient civilizations. You know, shamanistically, you know, it was part of the ritual you would take. You know, there were certain drugs that would open up certain levels of consciousness. So when you surrendered yourself into the dance, into the ritual, into the collective organism, you have this. You're opening yourself up. It's just, it's just, it's a key. On his website, Decker is very specific about the means by which his band will help his audience open up. Medicine Drum are modern shamans, he says, the techno pagans of electronica. They take the listener on an incredible journey into psychedelic trance. And Decker has loads of company. There are hundreds of bands and DJs who view their music in precisely the same way, as a form of techno-paganism, a gateway into trance and the spiritual world. Goa Gill, perhaps the most revered of the techno-tribal DJs, cut to the bottom line when he declared, music has gone through a complete cycle. It started in ancient times with tribal drumming, and now it's come back to tribal trance techno. I'm basically just using this whole party situation as a medium to do magic, to remake the tribal pagan ritual for the 21st century. It's an initiation. Quite often, these shamanistic experiences are intensified with the use of drugs, expanded now through modern pharmacology to include new and powerful psychotropics, including LSD. E or ecstasy, G and special K. When you drop this chemical bomb into your neuro system, you are cutting up all your previous inherited perceptions of what we call reality. Everyone suddenly has shamanic experience for a couple of dollars. And then there's the use of light and sound to manipulate, 
most DJs would say accentuate everything from metabolic rates to brainwave activity and states of consciousness. Whether we're talking about in training or photic and auditory driving, the terminology may be more sophisticated, but make no mistake about it, these alterations are based, often consciously, on occultic, shamanistic formulas. Indigenous rituals performed by shaman in the Peruvian Amazon and stuff, they would beat a drum at a certain number of wave cycles per second in modern club culture and in seeing modern club events and modern rave events and things like that. You're seeing people in training in the same brain state. You've got strobes, you have lighting that everyone's taking in, you have big time photic driving, and the music is auditory driving. That's why people get so excited at the rock concert and tear up the seats. It's because their metabolism is being governed by the bass and the rhythm and the light. And that's what it's all about. It has reduced down in the West for the first time to a ritual which admits to and utilizes the most arcane and ancient methods for achievement of altered states and a celebration of that contact with others. But what is this otherness that ravers often come in contact with? Into what are they being reborn? Reborn. Before we answer that, Allow me to again say that we're not questioning people's conscious intent or their sincerity. I know that many ravers don't use drugs and an even greater number really enjoy and are even comforted by the often sincere sense of community that a rave can produce. And compared to the brain deadness of a hardcore mosh pit, a rave can seem even sublime. But sincerity and new age goosebumps are not the ultimate arbiters of truth, as always. We need to look at both the methodologies and the fruit through the lens of scripture. And in that context, what we find once again departs from the true faith and gives clear heed to deceiving spirits and doctrines of demons. Not only do we find drug abuse, including the not infrequent overdose, not only do we encounter sexual immorality, sometimes reaching levels that rival the orgies of the ancient cult of Dionysus. But preeminently, whenever spirituality becomes open and ritualized, it invariably clothes itself in the garb of pagan and Eastern religions. You've seen him a million times, the dancing deity in the ring of fire, the image of the Hindu god Shiva. In searching for my personal connection to best explain these roots of trans dancing from ancient India, I felt I needed to go deeper than books. I felt the need to invoke Shiva. So last night, as I prepared to go to a party at the Dimension 7 warehouse in San Francisco, I considered my intention for the evening. I wanted to become a sacred temple dancer. I knew I was on target when I arrived and immediately was greeted by a large bronze statue of Shiva dominating the altar in front of the DJ. Shiva had indeed been invoked. The magic had been spun, and the time had come for me to experience my devotional dance. The techno beat morphed in my head, the mesmerizing drone of devotional songs being repeated over and over again. Ecstatically allowing the trance to overtake me, I felt my body gyrate in unfamiliar ways that seemed as old as Shiva himself. I was able to leave my body and observe myself in this new, old incarnation. The trance dance spiraled me into the deep meanings of these movements. So this must have been the justification for the nights of wild sex I've read about in those Hindu temples. It is obvious to me that they were also in the trance, induced by the rhythmic music of their own blissful states. I wondered what local concoctions the devotees imbibed. After all, Shiva is the god of sex and drugs and rock and roll. Within the warm, protective womb of Western, specifically Christian culture, these heartfelt observations may read like nothing more than a recipe for personal enlightenment. But both the Bible and the cultures that live within the full force of these demonic doctrines declare otherwise. There is a way that seems right to a man 
but its end is the way of death. <laughs>